So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to WeBit's Meet the Chair and CEO session. Um, I'm delighted to have both David Dadi Perlmutter, Chairman, and Kobi Hanoch, CEO of WeBit, to present to us today. Um, as with our other previous sessions that we've done in terms of Meet the CEO and Meet the Chair um, sessions, if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And I'll be moderating a Q&A after a short presentation from Kobi and Daddy. So um, Daddy and Kobi, thank you very much. I'll hand across to you and Kobi, I'll just uh, allow you to share your screen so you can walk people through um, a short slide presentation. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Kobi, you should be able to share your screen now. Okay. So, uh... Good morning, everyone, and uh, very happy uh, to be here with you. Um, I'll just do a quick overview of uh, the slides that I actually presented um, at the uh, at the TechOps conference. I won't go into all that detail that I did before, but um, just uh, quickly skim through them. Uh, I think, why is this not working? Um, okay. So uh, I guess most of you probably know WeBit, but very quickly, we're an Israeli company that's traded on the ASX. We're developing a non-volatile memory technology uh, in the semiconductor sector. Uh, I think our technology is uh, very advanced, much more advanced than the existing technology in terms of speed and uh, energy efficiency, et cetera. And uh, our biggest competitive advantage is that uh, we're just using standard uh, materials, uh, silicon oxide, so that um, this really makes it much easier to uh, transfer the technology to production facilities and uh, also uh, to adapt them and uh, move forward. We've been making very good progress. I think you've seen the announcements recently. Uh, the technology is basically ready uh, to move to a production fab. So now we are talking to different facilities and uh, trying to find the right one that uh, we can move forward with. And overall feeling very confident now with the technology. Uh, you know, the market is a very big market uh, today. Just the non-volatile market is estimated at 60 billion. Uh, U.S. dollars. It's expected to grow mm. to 100 billion U.S. by 2025. Uh, so even though semiconductors are now uh, pretty much flat, uh, memory still continues to grow at a double-digit uh, phase, even through the corona time. Um, I think you know our uh, management team. You know, I've been in semiconductors for uh, over 40 years already in different, mainly in startups on the startup side. We have uh, Daddy here with us on the call, uh, you know, in the semiconductor world, I really don't need to introduce him. Uh, he was uh, number two at Intel, led all of the Pentium designs. We have Yoav Nissan Cohen as an executive director. Uh, he's been in the, the non-volatile memory space since day one. He actually did his PhD under the guy who invented it. Uh, he was also the guy who set up Tower Semiconductor, which is uh, one of the world's leading fabs. So he, he really knows this domain very well and helps me a lot. Uh, we have Atik Raza, uh, who basically in the 90s took uh, a lesser known company called AMD and put it where it is today, where it's really uh, potentially even more advanced than Intel. Um, we have uh, our CTO, Amir. Uh, we just announced recently adding um, Eran Brieman as our VP marketing and uh, business development, now that we're having a lot more activity in that domain. And uh, of course, our two Australian uh, directors that uh, I'm very proud to have on board, uh, Fred Bart in Sydney and Ashley Krongold in uh, Melbourne. Uh, I think they're well-known people and were well-governed uh, in Australia. Um, just a very quick overview. You know, people in Australia don't know semiconductors uh, so much, but this is really the underlying technology 
uh, for everything today. You know, computers and, and all of your cell phones, applications, everything is basically running on semiconductors. So, you know, 10 years ago, from the top 10 market cap companies in the world, maybe just one was a semiconductor related company. Now, you know, it's almost all of them. The top five, uh, you know, are totally dependent on semiconductors for their revenues. Um, we talked about semiconductors. Memory is actually the largest sector in semiconductors. Any electronic device you can think of uh, has memory in it, uh, you know, be it drones, autonomous vehicles, your cell phones, your laptops, uh, your uh, refrigerator and uh, washing machine and everything. So, you know, this is really everywhere. And um, uh, I think it's, uh, it's really a great, uh, great domain to be in. Uh, by the way, when we talk about the cloud and people always say, oh, you know, I'm backing up stuff on the cloud or whatever, you know, we need to understand the cloud is huge data centers with unbelievable amounts of memory and, uh, uh, you know, just all of the surveillance cameras and everything uh, and, and all the pictures and videos that you take, they all need to go somewhere. And that's really what's fueling the memory industry. Um, you know, I... I talk very quickly here we the memory domains is split into embedded and uh, discrete or standalone components uh, embedded is when you take a memory and you embed it into a system on a chip where today you can put a full system on a single chip so you have the processor communication sensors etc and also memory and you have the discrete memories or this uh, single chip uh, standalone memory chips, which are all memory. Webit today at this point is focused on the embedded memory. Uh, our technology is basically ready to go uh, to, this, uh, to this domain. Uh, we're now developing the uh, module that will go and basically serve as the interface around uh, the memory array and uh, connect it to the rest of the system and making very good progress there. So overall, we're feeling uh, very uh, confident now about the move with Embedded. And as we announced, uh, we're basically uh, looking to move into the production uh, facilities now. Um, you heard me talk about China many times. It's a great market to be in. Uh, they are really pushing their semiconductor uh, uh, field uh, forward. Uh, the demand uh, in China is uh, rocketing. You can see the blue line on the right. Uh, the red line is the supply, internal supply. Uh, the imports that you can see here, the top two companies they import semiconductors from are Hynix and Samsung, which are basically memory companies. So you can understand why they're so excited about our technology. Um, and we're talking to the Chinese as well as uh, uh, production facilities all over the world. So it's, uh, uh, there's a focus on China, but uh, definitely not just China. Um, we, our technology I mentioned already is at the point where we have uh, what's called stabilized in our field. Uh, so it's ready to move to a production fab. Uh, we're talking to fabs from all over the world right now, uh, you know, it, it takes two to tango. So we need to find the one that uh, that is willing to actually give up uh, production time, uh, very, very expensive time in the fab to manufacture uh, things that make money and allocated to work with us. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're having some good progress with some of these. Um, the timeline, as uh, I think everyone uh, already uh, heard and knows, we're now at the point where we finished the stabilization process. We're going to have the module ready for uh, manufacture in Q1 and hopefully manufactured by the end of Q2. And that's more or less when we're aiming to have the uh, first customer or first uh, commercial orders. Um, so that's, uh, that's about it. Uh, you know, we, we're also looking at the neuromorphic field. This is something that's always in the background. 
Right now, it's, um, it's something which is more in the research uh, phase and we're cooperating with universities. Uh, Webit was the first uh, company to demonstrate uh, spiking neural networks running on RERAM and that caused uh, a lot of uh, attention uh, last year and earlier this year. So we're focused on this, but this is really uh, something in the background. It's not the, the key activity at this point of, of the company. So I think I'll stop here. Uh, thank you, Kobe. Um, we do have, and Daddy, I've got a question for you I'll ask if I could, but um, we do have a number of questions that have come through and just reminding everybody you can either email me, ron.bachelor at marketeye.com today, you, or send a question via the Q&A. Uh, Daddy, it just perhaps I could ask you a question first. Kobe touched on the strength and the quality of the board and the, man, the senior management team. Can you perhaps for the um, participants on our session today, just give them a little bit of background on sort of your background and importantly, as chairman, why did you want to get involved with Webit? What did you <coughs> see as the opportunity for Webit? Uh, thank you, Ron, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm in the semiconductor industry for more than 40 years. <clears throat> Most of it I've spent at Intel Corporation when I was <clears throat> in my last job, uh, the executive vice president and chief product officer of the company. Uh, in that regard, I was basically managing all Intel uh, product development and, uh, and business. Uh, which I grew from 30 billion to 50 billion plus in, uh, in my tenure of uh, four years. Uh, I know semiconductor, I know the industry, I know the computer industry inside out. All the big names that you know from Apple to Google to Facebook have been my customers, uh, also Alibaba. Uh, and I also spent time after uh, uh, leaving Intel, still in the semiconductor industry, both as an investor, as an entrepreneur, and director in some of the key companies. One of them was uh, Mellanox, uh, which is another big uh, semiconductor company that was sold to NVIDIA uh, for six and a half billion dollars uh, just earlier this year. Uh, so I know this industry inside out. <clears throat> you know, it, it's interesting because the world have learned to know the power of technology in the past few years with social uh, networks, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Apples of the world. And Kobe mentioned in his talk that the fuel below all this technology is semiconductors. Uh, all of you are owning already tens of semiconductor devices uh, in your pocket, in your home, or each time you go into your car or whatever you do, or you even you, when you surf on the internet, you're using thousands or millions of semiconductor devices. A uh, big portion of it is memory because uh, information has to be spoiled and the amount of information generated in the world basically triples every year, uh, which is a huge number. And this is why I'm excited because the semiconductor looks like one big homogeneous thing, but this world is changing uh, very fast. Uh, one of the big uh, keys of this world is called Moore's Law. Moore was the founder of Intel. Dr. Moore was the founder of Intel. And he coined the fact that a semiconductor device will contain twice as many devices uh, every two years, which basically created all these wonderful opportunities that you see. But in order to fulfill this one, it's very tough. It's not an easy job. And every several years, uh, a big transformation in the technology happens. It happens below the hood. Uh, most of you will never notice it. You just get a better device when you buy it. Uh, you get more memory on your phone when you buy it. Uh, and you don't know what's below it, but below it is a huge walk. The memory industry uh, in general and the non-volatile in particular is basically uh, getting harder and harder to increase the amount of devices, the amount of bits at, single device could store. And this is the time where new, new, what we call emerging technology comes in. In my view, my personal view, this is the most exciting time to be it. Why? Because as long as the memory continues to evolve, this is the game of the big guys. They know the job, they've invested billions in their factories and they are doing anything they can to promote. The small guys could come in 
when there is a big transformation in the market, new inventions are coming in, and now you need to have the right team, the right people with the right connections and the right knowledge uh, to pull it in. And I believe Webit has a wonderful base of technology. In the past five years, we've spent uh, a lot of time to promote this, te this technology. Uh, as Kobe mentioned, we are getting closer to the fact that we could really talk to customers on real products and hopefully we could get the deals done. And I bet there are going to be a lot of questions about that. Uh, this, is a, this is extremely exciting. And if you are successful, then the uh, opportunities are huge. This is not uh, a few million dollar sales a year. This could turn into a huge company if you are doing uh, our job right. And this is where why I come in. This is why I joined with it because this is what I did. This is what I did at Intel. When I was at Intel, I did exactly the same. Created new technologies, uh, new things that each time promoted uh, new heights of uh, business uh, for the company. This is how this uh, market behaves. This is how technology company behaves. And if you have the right team and the right people and the right technology, uh, you could do marvels. A um, couple of questions that have been sent to me in advance, and I'll, I'll ask the first one. Um, you touched on it a bit just before, Daddy, around the big companies and the small companies coming in as technology transforms. Um, how, how, how can Webit, how does Webit compete against the big semiconductor memory companies, given we're a lot smaller? And, and I guess the, the follow on question is, does that mean that Webit ultimately could be taken out? You know, possibilities are, uh, are uh, you know, all over. In the, semi, in the semiconductor industry and in tech in general, uh, you know, the common belief that the, uh, the big giants uh, will not let anything grow, uh, but the truth of the matter, then it's not. All the tech giants that we know today have been small companies, startups, just, uh, you know, Google was started uh, in Facebook about 20 years ago. They were nothing. Who knew? Um, you know, people thought that uh, Microsoft will kill everything. Well, Microsoft did the transformation themselves. The way it works, that is a lot of room for opportunities. And it's an ecosystem. The big companies do not necessarily want to step over small companies when they're small. In many cases, they let them grow and they watch them. In some cases, they compete with them. In some cases, they buy them. And sometimes you pay big money uh, for uh, a technology that the big company missed and I say, oh my God, the world is going the other direction with against what I thought. And I just going to put my hands in the pocket and buy them. Or if you manage yourself good enough, you are becoming a big supplier and a big uh, company yourself. Uh, it's a game. And in a sense, I've seen a lot of culture coming. It's a game you play every day. It's not, oh my God, in a year, I'll think about this one. This is the game you play, you talk to people, you talk to in the industry, the industry come and talk to you. Uh, Kobe and I get a lot of phone calls, let's meet, let's talk. 99.9% uh, .9 of those are just get to know, finding out what's going on. And some of it turn into, well, let's do something together and see how it's done. That's the nature of the industry. And that's why it's so exciting. Um, Kobe, in the presentation slides that you showed, there was a slide on the China opportunity. We have a question that um, just queries, does, the chi does doing stuff with Chinese customers or Chinese suppliers potentially limit us in other Western markets? So, you know, at this point, uh, we're talking to companies and, and fabs all over the world. We're talking to American ones, Korean ones, Chinese ones, and others. So there's uh, really, at this point, we're not limited at all. Uh, you know, we're, of course, there is a focus on China. Uh, you know, we need to see this whole war between, you know, quotes, war between uh, US and China uh, is something that is still not clear. The, the big companies, by the way, the big American companies are still ch selling in China and operating in China. Uh, you know, there are some limitations here and there, but it's not like, you know, there's a total break here or anything. And I don't expect there to be a total break. So, you know, we we're monitoring things, but uh, at this point we're talking to everyone and we're trying to proceed, you know, um, find the right partner. It doesn't really matter where. I believe there's a good chance it'll be Chinese, but it doesn't have to be. 
Uh, let me let me just one sentence. You have to manage this with care. The biggest issue in all this stuff is IP. Are you giving a Chinese company control on your IP? And we are not going to do that. That's a big no at this stage. But every company you know, Apple manufactures in China. Uh, Apple, Intel, Nvidia, everybody sells in China. Uh, it's not a band that you do not talk and make business with Chinese. It's most of the issues are intellectual property. And in that regards, uh, we are going to create uh, intellectual property, not just with Chinese, with everybody else. That's, that's, uh, that's our lifeline. So I think that, uh, and we have a lot of experience with uh, work with Chinese, both myself and Atik have done a lot of business in China. And, uh, but like anything in business, you have to manage it with a lot of being very careful. I was actually going to ask you, Daddy, a question that someone asked about IP and you've just answered it, so, so thank you. Um, uh, staying on China, um, and Kobe, maybe a question for you. You may or may not be able to provide the answer. How many fabs are you in discussion with and are they only in China or are they elsewhere? So we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're talking to fabs really in many countries. Uh, China now has taken the lead in terms of building new fabs. Uh, they are building now, as far as we know, about 30 new fabs in parallel, which is mind boggling. I mean, this is like unbelievable. And, and so the new fabs are the best place to bring in new technology because they haven't really invested in the old technology. It's not like they're an existing fab that already has flash and everything they need, want to add new stuff. So it's a great opportunity. And that's why we're talking to uh, quite a bit, quite a few uh, fabs uh, also in China, and we're talking to fabs, as I said, uh, in other countries. So um, it's it's really an exciting time now. Um, question here, can you clarify, please, the process involved in getting from the transition from a fab to customer requirements? Is the fab a customer or are they a partner to enable the customer requirements? Mm -hmm. So, so this is actually a good question uh, to, to understand the market. Uh, in the embedded space, I'll focus on this because this is where we're looking for revenue right now. Uh, there are three players. There's the technology provider, which is Webit. There's the fab where you manufacture this technology. And then there's the design house that designs the product, you know? So uh, because fabs are so expensive and so difficult, uh, even the largest companies like Apple, Google, Facebook, Qualcomm don't have their own fabs and they rely on production facilities. Uh, so we need to work with both. And that's, uh, you know, that can be sometimes uh, more of a challenge, but uh, this is how this industry works. So we need to take the technology now and transfer it to a production fab and then that production fab needs to qualify it. It's a process where they need to take it and make sure that it uh, fits their process, their machinery, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, that's not a simple process to go through. Once that is ready, you know, they are ready to manufacture. In parallel, you need to work with a design house so that they will, uh, in their next uh, system on a chip, they will, uh, plan to use our technology. They will license our technology and basically design it in. So they will take, uh, they will need to take the module. The module that we're doing is basically a, like a prototype module because you need to adapt it to the specific system on a chip every time. And that's why uh, we need to engage with these customers. There's normally what's called a non-recurrent engineering fee for this adaptation. And that customer uh, then, you know, normally it takes a year, a year and a half plus or minus for them to get to where they can uh, uh, tape out what it's called to go to production and they transfer the design to the fab and the fab starts manufacturing. So, you know, these are long processes. It's uh, semiconductor is not a simple domain, but, um, you know, we're moving forward very well with it. In terms of the moving forward, we've got a question here. Um, in the quarterly report we just lodged, you noted that it was critical for engineers to be on site working with partners. Does this preclude formal commercial terms being reached prior to the physical transfer taking place? Uh, we do have a challenge now with COVID and the fact that we can't really be flying to, to places. Uh, you know, with XTX, we just had an engineer go with a wafer in his hand. 
Actually, we had two of them. They sat with XTX and uh, worked with them uh, and did the testing and so on. It's, it's much more challenging when you can't actually send an engineer and a wafer in their hand to the customer. So, uh, so we are working on ways to go around it. Um, you know, we're adapting. Uh, and, and this, uh, by the way, this is true, you know, the, the no flight uh, situation right now, I think it's impacting everyone. Uh, in our case, it's also that, you know, the R&D team is working, Israel and, and uh, France need to work through Zoom all the time instead of sitting in the same room, uh, brainstorming sessions for, for two, three days uh, a week, or, uh, a month or something like that. So um, it is a challenge. Uh, I don't think that it will preclude a deal. Um, it makes it uh, more challenging, more exciting. I'm just uh, I'll tell care. you from my experience, I've, I've been involved in uh, many companies. It's quite amazing what kind of uh, innovative ways people find out to overcome. And in some cases, they find it even more productive. I uh, think you wouldn't even consider just a year ago, all of a sudden people saying, you know what, we can make it work. Is it hard? It is hard. In some cases, you really want to be in the lab. But so far, we've been able to overcome most of it. Uh, and we'll have to continue to work that. Uh, it's, it's not going to be easy. Hopefully, there's going to be time of ease when people could fly or uh, meet someplace, uh, you know, a green country or whatever. We'll see how it works. Uh, we'll have to be very innovative and very creative about what we do. Yeah, by the way, depending on the country, uh, some countries we can actually send the engineer with the wafer. They'll need to be in quarantine for two weeks, for example, and then they can go out and work and things like that. So it's not like we, we can't work at all with you know sending people over. It's just more difficult. Um, there was a question around clarifying timeframes, and I should just clarify that the slide that Kobe showed with the timeline is calendar years, not financial years. Um, just as we talk about timing, then a follow-on question. Um, we recently hired Aran Bremen. Can you talk about what his role will entail over the next six to 12 months? Uh, yeah, uh, Aran already for, uh, I guess, more than 15 years. Uh, he's an amazing uh, marketing and business development guy. He uh, he took Siva, he basically joined Siva on day one when they started the company. And, uh, you know, today Siva is the number one uh, uh, digital signal processing company in the world, which is a very important domain. So, uh, and then he went to uh, Core Photonics and uh, was also part of their acquisition by Samsung. So he's, he's really a very experienced guy. He's helping me now analyze the market, analyze the different uh, partnership uh, potentials. Uh, you know, for each uh, partner, the, the analysis of what are their main weak points or strong points, what are their main needs, what can we offer them, you know, where, how is the best match? So he's helping me a lot on building the, um, uh, you know, we talk about commercial agreement, basically, all of these terms, these are not simple agreements that we just say, okay, we have a product to sell, it's, it costs X, you pay us and that's it. It's, these agreements are much more elaborate. They contain uh, you know, the, the technology transfer or, or even the, the licensing agreements. They have many more terms and uh, you know, he's, he's really a huge asset for that. Uh, question on the competitive landscape. Can you, how far, sorry, how far, ahead or behind are we compared to the nearest competition in terms of next gen memory technology re-ram or otherwise um, i think we're we're pretty much at par you know if you look at the other re-ram companies uh there's uh you know one of them which is more or less where we are uh you know working on transferring their technology to production fabs Another one actually fell off the radar. I haven't heard their name at all for a year. I know that their management team, they, they had some internal issues there with their, between their management and investors and uh, the man, most of the managers left and I actually don't know where they stand right now. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's another company traded here in Australia that I guess people can see the reports and see where we stand versus them. So, um, uh, you know, I think we're we're in a better position. They, uh, you know, as far as I saw from their reports, they uh, uh, they still don't have uh, 
a memory array yet. So uh, I guess we're more advanced than they are. Um, uh, uh, one, uh, one thing I, I want to add, uh, we continue to talk about that and I know it's a complex topic. Uh, we all the time for the past five years talk about the manufacturing and the fact that uh, the Weebit technology is unique by the fact that it doesn't use, uh, you know, uh, strange, uh, strange materials that fabs do not use or do not uh, use or not does need new machinery. He helped us a lot to progress as fast as we could in the past few years. And I think in a critical phase that Kobe talked about of going into production, now is real test how fast it's going to take a fab a factory to uh, acclimate uh, Weebit technology versus someone else's technology. This is a critical first to pick who you want to work with. I'm talking from the mm -hmm. perspective of the fab and also how fast and how much resources the fab will have to spend into getting exactly same results that we got with Letty into their own factory. This is the whole thing. They want to see that they could get done. Uh, we believe that this is going to continue to be an even more important uh, factor of uh, our strengths and our competitive edge going forward into productization of the product. Uh, Daddy, you just mentioned Letty. One of the questions we have is what's the nature of Weebit's relationship with Letty in France? So I don't know if it's Kobe, if you can answer that. Uh, go yeah. ahead, anyone else? So, go ahead, Kobe. Yeah, it's uh, we we have a really close relationship with them. It's actually an amazing relationship. The level of trust and um, you know you, you can say it's it's already telepathy between the teams. We 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 really work very well together. The teams are you know we have engineers that are sitting inside the Letty building, inside the Letty facility working with Letty uh, day in, day out. Uh, the team in Israel is, you know, almost on a daily basis on the phone with them and Zoom and whatever. So it's a very close relationship. We're developing the technology together. I consider it just one team. Uh, the technology that we're developing is uh, a technology that uh, according to the agreement, uh, it belongs to both companies and the patents that we register from this work are registered under both names, but uh, Webit is the only one that can commercialize it. So in reality, uh, at the end of the day, we, we have total control over uh, using this technology in a commercial way. Um, also, can you, um, we've had a couple of questions about the move to fabs. Is one of them uh, associated with Letty? Um, no, Letty is a government facility, an R&D facility. <laughs> yeah. They are not, uh, not related to, uh, I mean, they have a relationship, uh, you know, they sit right on the same fence with uh, ST Micro, but um, our communication has, uh, you know, of course they they can they give us contact names of people in some fabs or things like that, but it's not related to Letty at all. Um, great, we had a couple of questions on that specifically. Um, Daddy, maybe one for you, and you touched on your background. Can you talk about Yoav and Atik and what they bring to Weebit, please? Sure, uh, happily, you know, it uh, took me a time to, to get them in. Um, <clears throat> I'll start with Atik. Atik, uh, uh, strangely enough, he was managing the company that was my fiercest uh, competitor. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we became good friends uh, because we appreciate, you know, it's like two good chess players. Uh, on one hand, trying to beat each other, but on the other hand, appreciate the, uh, the depth and the, uh, and the knowledge and the appreciation. Um, when I joined Webit, I started talking to Atik, with whom I talk about a lot of things in the, in the industry uh, on a regular basis, and I asked him to join Webit, and I was very happy that he could. Uh, you know, uh, Atik is a serial entrepreneur. He started multiple companies and got them to huge succession. Uh, his startup company was bought by AMD, and then he became the president of the company. And he made the transformation, could be mentioned. Uh, he since then started a few companies. Uh, one of them is sold in China. So he, the guy knows a lot. He's extremely appreciated in the industry and uh, you know, everybody in the semiconductor industry knows his name. Uh, Yoav is another good example. He's a PhD in physics. 
Uh, Atik is also uh, has a, uh, a degree in physics. Uh, he walked, he basically did his PhD with uh, Professor Dov Froman, who is the inventor of this, uh, uh, this technology, you know, the basis of the technology of uh, uh, storing uh, information on a semiconductor device. Uh, he eventually became a, a CEO of one uh, of a big, a very big uh, uh, fab a tower, Jazz, which uh, resides in Israel, but was uh, converged together with another Japanese uh, <clears throat> uh, fab house. So he knows the technology inside out, both from the technology side and also from the uh, fabrication, the manufacturing side. So, were, you know, with these two people on your board, you basically know everyone, could anticipate the problems way ahead they become. Uh, and when the problems occur, they know what's the best way to go attack them, both from technology side and also from the business side, because they know and they're a huge help in, you know, driving the strategy for the company. I think it's a huge asset. Kobe, maybe a question for you, and sometimes it can be, uh, you know, we've obviously got the chairman sitting with you, but, you know, you have a pretty high caliber board, uh, three industry luminaries sitting on the board. How do you, how do you find working with a board like that? And how have you been able to, you know, get the most out of your board as most CEOs try to? Oh, it's, uh, I can't even start to explain what it's like to work with such a board. I mean, you know, it's really amazing. I've been in startups and I've been, you know, acquired before. I've had good boards, bad boards, but this is just phenomenal. You know, I think we have a, a really, really good cooperative uh, uh, collaboration and, and it's, you know, they, they're available for me when I need to talk to them. You know, they're just a, a phone call away. Uh, getting advice from such people is, is great. And I think we have a very good level of, uh, of respect uh, among all of us, you know, so it's, uh, it's a great team um, and, and really, you know, very friendly. And uh, so the, the, the amazing thing is there's zero politics in the company. It's, it's just all of us together working very well together. Um, and and it's, it's really, I'm humbled. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Uh, I, I feel like every time we ask a question, there's two more added to the list. So it's one of those, we, we, we're not actually getting ahead of the flow of questions and I'm conscious of time. So I'll try and bulk some questions together. And I apologize to anybody if we don't quite ask the question that you've asked. Uh, but maybe there's a, a number of questions thinking about talking about commercialization. And you may not be able to answer this in detail, Kobe. Obviously, some of it will be commercially sensitive. But what what, can you give a bit of a sense of what industries or applications you're talking to in terms of possible future partnerships, um, opportunities for the, for the technology? Can you give any further color? Okay. So I think, uh, you know, when you look at what we have in our hand right now and you, you start with what you have in your hand and then you expand forward you know the technology that we current have when we're talking about 40 nanometers and, and the technical parameters it lends itself very easily to domains like iot you know internet of things uh to security uh to the analog sensors domain uh those are all i mean mostly uh using um geometries which are larger than 40 nanometer so, you know, we can address them quite easily and we have a very good, uh, you know, for each one of those, we have our specific uh, advantages, you know, for going back to the question about Iran, Iran is really sitting there and looking at the different market niches and what are our biggest advantages and, and selling points for each one, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, those are the first ones, uh, you know, later on. We'll also look at, uh, at additional markets. You know, basically, as I said, every electronic component in the world needs a non-volatile memory. So uh, we'll be expanding on. We've had a couple of questions on Professor Tour. Is he still involved in some capacity within Weber? Uh, we've, we've gone a long way 
since the technology that we got from Professor Tour. So in terms of the technology, we're in a much, much, much more advanced position than you know where we were when we took uh, the technology. In that sense, uh, he has, uh, you know, in the early days, he was much more involved. Uh, you know, we, he's still on our advisory board. We still have communication with him. But, uh, you know, now uh, with all the progress that we've done, and he's, he's involved in many, many different domains. You know, I think if you look at it, he's one of the most cited mm -hmm. professors in the world. Uh, all of the different works that he does, and he's involved in so many companies. So, um, <clears throat> so we, have, uh, we have a communication going. I actually talked to him last week, but um, it's, uh, uh, you know, much less than before. <laughs> Um, we've got a number of questions around the commercialization side of things. I'll try and again bundle it up because I'm conscious of timing. Um, is the plan to license chip designs or is it to make our own chips exclusively? And what's the, what's the revenue model, revenue profile look like? We're rather obviously giving, you know, dollar revenue guidance to specific timeframes, but what's the business model going forward once Webit starts commercializing? So I'll focus right now on the embedded because this is really the what we're focusing focused on now. The embedded memory market is basically an IP market. So it's basically IP licensing. Uh, you because our memory goes into a system on a chip that the design house designs. You know, if you think of uh, you know uh, an Apple, Facebook, uh, Qualcomm, Google, whoever it is. Uh, that designs their chip and they need inside it the memory. So, you know, so they basically take our IP and plug it into their system. And then they take that and they send that to the fabrication house to manufacture. Okay, so we, you cannot manufacture an embedded component um, because it, it goes into the chip, it's just part of that chip. Um, so uh, the, the model is that the, you, you have actually two business models. You can have an agreement with the fab where the fab licenses your technology and then it offers it to the design houses that come to them. And so the fab pays you some licensing fee and then you get royalties on the wafers that they manufacture. You can also go to the design houses and a design house basically pays you a license fee and pays you, uh, I mentioned the NRE, the uh, engineering fee to adapt the module to their needs. And then once they manufacture, you get royalties uh, per chip sold from their side. So those are the two business models that are possible in this domain. Um given what's happened with the share price over the last little while, there's obviously a bunch of questions about share price and so on. Um, so, you know, I guess the, the key thing is what, you know, from what people have asked, what, what do you think of the recent share price action? Mm -hmm. And I guess the, the, the follow on to that is, given where the share price is and the options that are listed, um, how are you thinking about um, the capital that could come through from the options if they get exercised? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the company has been re-rated. Uh, we're finally where I think the, you know, the share price actually reflects much better where we, you know, the, the real value of the company. Uh, I think we were severely underrated for a very long time. Uh, I believe the investors are seeing now that we are getting closer to, uh, you know, to the production, uh, to, to commercialization. Uh, you know, it's important for people to understand, you know, this is a process, we're talking to fabs and, uh, you know, it, it takes time to find the right one and to reach an agreement, but we're in that process and I think people are realizing that. So uh, I think that's what we're seeing right now. In terms of uh, the options, obviously, you know, when people exercise the options and we get the additional money, there is so much more that we we still want to do and we want to move forward. Uh, I'd love to accelerate, uh, you know, some of the activities. And uh, once we get the money from the options, uh, you know, we'll be able to push forward with those things as well. Um, thank you. We've had a couple of questions around uh, contracts and 
a reference to discussion around getting some tier two contracts in place. Um, how does that play into also getting contracts in place with some of the bigger technology companies? Um, I think I mentioned it in the past. Uh, the challenge is, and people always want to see that you're talking to the big guys. And, you know, obviously we are talking to, to some of the big guys. And, and uh, But when you want to build a business agreement and you're still, you know, a smaller company, you want to talk to someone that uh, looks you more in the eye. The big guys, uh, and I've seen so many startups go bankrupt because they tried to jump too high. And the big guys would just dictate so many things that they would want to see without paying. And you know, it, it was a huge challenge. So I am a strong believer from my 40 years of experience with this. It's much better to talk to someone who's a tier two or a tier three company that needs your technology, that wants to become a number, a tier one, and your technology is an enabler for them to become a tier one. And you talk to them, it's much more, it's a much better cooperation and you can actually move much faster. Uh, that way, you know, later on, you obviously start talking to the bigger guys, but I'm a big believer in working with the tier two, tier three first. A um, couple more questions, and I think we'll have to unfortunately wrap it up because we're still we're still not making any inroads into the list of questions. Um, what current risks are associated with the product prior to getting to commercialization? So, uh, so basically, hmm. we've, we've you want uh, daddy? Do you want to answer? Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll take it. Um, yeah. You know, the 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 risk is by far smaller. The techno I'll, I'll, I'll separate it from a technology risk to a business risk. From a technology perspective, uh, it's relatively, it's way smaller than before. There are always surprises, but I think that, especially after our last uh, announcement that we are kind of got to all kind of uh, another progress in the manufacturability of the product, all the parameters, uh, we're quite confident that what we have is something we could we could go manufacture. So it's now it's more of a, a schedule risk. Would we get something done on time? You know, there's always the worries about COVID, some unexpected problem that will take you a bit longer to fix. Uh, and, uh, you know, the list is long and we can manage it. Uh, so it could be some schedule risk associated, but not a technology risk. Uh, business, we are still uh, talking to people uh, until we have a real agreement. I'll put the risk as a medium. We believe we could, we have, uh, or close to medium low, uh, because we are talking very closely with some of the customers. Some of them we mentioned in the past, and I think it's it's manageable. We've done that in the past. There's nothing uh, we have not done before in different life than uh, than this one. So it's not something you'd say never done before. So I think it's a, it's a manageable risk. So I think at this stage, uh, our ability to perform is, uh, is at a lower risk, way lower than we just started a few years ago. Um, could you maybe, and maybe this one's for Kobe, could you provide, to the extent you can, can you provide an update with regards to some of the various relationships with other partners that you've previously mentioned, like Silvaco, CN, and, and so on? Um, yeah, so we're, we're continuing to work with all of them, um, you know, talking to all of them. Uh, you know, we, I think uh, CN, we talked about them and, uh, you know, it's a very good uh, uh, relationship. Uh, you know, their, their fabs are coming up to speed now and uh, we're talking about the potential of uh, our technology going into their fabs. So there's a good discussion there. With XTX, uh, XTX is a, is a design company that doesn't have a fab. So they pointed us to the fabs that they work with. And you know, we're in touch with the fabs that they work with on you know, seeing how we can uh, transfer technology to them and what it would take to adapt it. Uh, you know, the Korean company, uh, we're uh, you know, continuing the discussions with them. So there's, you know, these are all continuing relationships. I think it's it's really important to to uh, to explain, and maybe this is the right place to to help set the expectations. 
you know, WeBit has a great technology. You know, obviously, I'm, uh, I, I believe we have an amazing technology. Uh, but uh, when you talk to these companies, uh, for them, they look at it as, oh, this has never been proven before. This is uh, something new. There's a, a risk associated with it. You know, it's always easier to work with the technology that you know that, that has been, you know, used already in production mode. So, you know, getting that first deal, getting that first partner is always a big challenge, you know, and uh, uh, many, many companies that we talk to that we think are a perfect match for us, you know, might just be too busy with something else or, or uh, you know, they might just be more conservative and they say, you know, oh, you know, it looks like a great thing, but um, uh, we don't want, you know, it's, it's very costly. The fab is a very... You know, the, even the cheapest fabs cost more than a billion U.S. dollars to set up. And uh, just allocating time to work with us is a major decision for them because that's time that they don't manufacture stuff that brings in money. So there are challenges uh, with these things. I think people are seeing the potential of the technology. And uh, they, uh, you know, we have a lot of people who are very interested and we're making progress with them. Uh, I hope to have good announcements. Um, you know, I don't want to set any expectations, but we're we're clearly making very good progress. So, you know, all the stuff that I said is just I, I know that some people are expecting us to have a commercial agreement tomorrow, and uh, you know, it's it takes time to really uh, get these things working. But when it'll be done, you know, I think the the bottleneck will be open, and the the following agreements are much easier to. And we probably have uh, as Kobe to... mentioned, I think it's an important uh, thing to understand. Kobe mentioned it before, but I want to stress this out. You want to find the people that would want to take the risk with you because if you succeed and they succeed, they could leapfrog ahead of their competition. Mm -hmm. People that are on top of the pack, they will not take risk. This is the, the nature of this industry, which I talked before. Mm -hmm. So it's not easy to find these people, but I think we have more than few that uh, see the opportunities, but now we have to structure the right way of how we work together uh, and make sure that it works. We, ha we have time for two more questions because I'm conscious we're now almost approaching five o'clock here in Australia. Um, just talking about risk study um, with the US question here, with the US sanctions on China for semiconductors, do you see this as a major business risk? It could be like any risk. It could create an opportunity. If the, U if the Chinese could not buy semiconductor products from the US, which most of them are generated in Taiwan and Korea, uh, then they would want to go in-house. And if they want to go in-house, uh, if they have a product they could use and uh, do in-house, it's a big opportunity for them. Uh, you know, if war strikes and things go bad, who knows? But uh, I think it's you have to look at the opportunities, not just the risks. And as long as so far, as we understand where things are going, so far, if you don't have a an IP risk, uh, then you're good. Uh, and uh, being able to fulfill uh, Chinese need, Chinese purchase almost fifty percent of semiconductor uh, products in the world for their manufacturing and their consumption. So uh, I think we need to look at that as an opportunity, not just as a risk. Um, one, one last question, and maybe one for both of you. Um, it's a slightly longer term uh, question, but where, where do you see Webit, Webit in three to five years' time? Oh, that's, uh, Go ahead, Kobe. I'll, I'll make the last sentence after you. I have, uh, yeah, I, uh, I have a lot of uh, very nice dreams about that one. So. Uh, I think that in three to five years, uh, you know, the embedded technology will already be up and running in, you know, in at least one, probably more uh, production fabs. Uh, we'll, we'll start seeing the revenue coming in. You need to remember that, um, you know, we'll be getting license uh, fee agreements. Uh, you know, the royalties will start coming in a year and a half after we sign a license fee because uh, companies need to design their chip and get it to production. But, uh, you know, in five years, we'll start seeing the royalties coming in and that's where the big revenues are. 
Um, so it looks very good. And, and on the standalone memory, we'll be already at the point where, uh, you know, we, we, get, uh, we get the first uh, chips, uh, uh, you know, ready or not chips, but the design ready to go also into manufacturing. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's going to be a huge potential when that happens. Daddy? And in, well, I should mention in parallel, you know, the, the background work with neuromorphic, I guess, in three to five years will start uh, moving more to the front side of things. I think the, uh, the research institutes will start having results and uh, we'll be taking a close look at how, how we can leverage that uh, technology. Thanks, Kobe. Daddy? I'll second Kobe. I think we we have a we, we'll have revenue. I hope, uh, interestingly, good revenue, and hopefully we'll have in our pipe even new product ideas based on this uh, wonderful technology, even beyond the neuromorphic uh, Kobe mentioned. The opportunities for new technology are just growing, and neuromorphic is a big one and could turn into a huge thing for us. But that's still in the research phase, and therefore. Uh, it's part of a dream, not uh, an execution plan. Daddy and Kobe, thank you very much for your time today. It's now after five o'clock, so we'll have to wrap it up. I'm sure we could probably have continued talking for another two hours because, as I said, every question we answered, two more were being added to the list. So I do apologise to those that we haven't had the opportunity to ask their question or to those where only a partial part of their question could be asked. But, look, thank you very much for your time. Clearly, the company is at a really exciting inflection point in terms of its growth profile. You've delivered on everything you said you would in terms of milestones within budget on time for the last few years. And, and hopefully you will continue to do so. And so, you know, on, on that note, and without, you know, uh, wanting to detract from the three to five year view, which is even more exciting than the next six to 12 months, um, you know, it looks like exciting times ahead. And with a great board and a management team to hopefully deliver on that opportunity. So look, on behalf of the 300 plus people who were listening in today, thank you very much for your time and importantly for your openness in answering all these questions. Um, if anybody has any other questions, please let us know. Email me, ron.betchdraw.marketeye.com.au and to the extent we can uh, help you further understand the opportunities that are ahead for Webit, we're more than happy to. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night in Australia and have a good day in Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You.